So here's a uh, fairly local station located across the river in town. And uh, as you can see, it's kind of hard to tell what's going on by using the broad beam. We have to go off almost 30 degrees each side of center before we see a change. However, if we go for the null, How sharp that is. Right there. And that station would be straight in that direction. So in part two of uh, our ferrite journey, we're going to actually go through the construction of a TRF system that's based on the uh, ferrite rod as the front end antenna. What are we really building? It's an active antenna. This is the basis for an active antenna. Something you can hold in your hand that actually is giving you the same performance as a much larger physically sized antenna. Also in part two we'll start to explore the physical size of the rod and how that affects signals. How to put windings on the rods either uh, one beside each other or is it better to maybe put them on top of each other. Uh, directivity. Um, we'll measure the AL or the permeability of the rods I'm going to introduce you to a piece of antique equipment used to measure inductance. So the pocket radio really came about because uh, ferrite allowed uh, the antenna to be small enough to make a pocket radio uh, a practical thing in the uh, in the 50s, and the uh, in the U.S. that's you know the one band that we have today. And, uh, there were different types of uh, receivers developed and uh, super hats of course. In Europe however they also had a long wave band so that meant that you had to have uh, two different bands you were covering with your ferrite. So you had a long wave and a regular AM medium wave coil and uh, you'll see the Euro sets will have uh, two sets of coils usually on the same piece of ferrite. So it's a two band affair. Then we need to uh, maybe uh, talk a little bit about radio direction finders. Uh, as you know, the, uh, the ferrite rod exhibits a figure eight pattern. Basically, you have two maximas and two nulls. So you can use this to take bearings. Interestingly enough, the, uh, the uh, nulls are much sharper than the broad parts of the beam. So that's the part that uh, you want to use to uh, find your target. You want to use the nulls, not the maxima. You might be able to get 20 or 30 degrees with the maxima, but with the nulls you can actually get down to a few degrees. Um, if the nulls are too deep, uh, you sometimes can lose the station. And uh, the longer the rod, the, the depth of the nulls increases. And uh, sometimes a small, uh, a shorter ferrite rod is actually more effective than, uh, than a longer one when you're looking to, uh, to take a bearing on a station. We've got the Watkins Johnson 8711 and the reason I brought it back out again is um, I wanted to try to show you the directivity of the, uh, of the, uh, the rod using the S meter on the receiver. turns out that the meter on the, uh, the Watkins Johnson cannot be made sensitive enough to show it because it has a linear in dB type scale. So with this log scale uh, you don't get the uh, the dip that you would like to uh, to show you the uh, direction to the station. So instead I have this low cost um, ICOM receiver uh, tuned to the station and it has a more conventional S meter so we can we can do some some work with it to try to show the the null a little more effectively. Now even the uh, because the, the unit has so much gain even it has trouble showing you know the null but you can easily see the station is this direction. So here's a case where our crystal radio uh, did a better job at uh, giving us uh, a bearing than uh, one of the most uh, 
sophisticated uh, knob type receivers out there. So, so way back in the 70s when I was in an electrical shop, we did build crystal radios and uh, there was a hobbyist magazine that had an article on a tuned radio frequency stage for your crystal set. It used a, a single RF PNP germanium transistor along with a ferrite rod and you had to wind some Litz wire on, on the rod and space it very carefully. And I remember I built that. It did not work the way this one does where you can actually pick up signals through the air without a ground or, or an outside antenna. But it worked very well when you did connect it to an antenna and a ground. So I used it like that. I have since lost that article and uh, I wish I still had it so I could uh, show you that, that particular circuit. But uh, we probably couldn't get those transistors anyway. So better to build something with a fairly modern circuit using the 2N2222s or the 3904s and seeing realistically what we can accomplish with uh, uh, with a modern ferrite rod. Well, the construction of the uh, ferrite TRF amplifier is pretty straightforward. Uh, just the typical wooden board construction is, is what I'm using in this series. Uh, feel free to use something more sophisticated than uh, this primitive method. Uh, different rods. Uh, I started out with a six inch type of uh, piece of ferrite and uh, then I ended up uh, with a longer piece to try to see if I was getting more gain. Can begin to see what we're going for here. We've got the ferrite rod suspended up in the air a little bit and uh, the reason for that is we want to be able to pick up signals and uh, if you're sitting this on a uh, a desk or some other object that's got metal in it that's going to uh, detune the uh, the ferrite rod won't pick up as well so we want to get that up in the air a little bit i think i was getting pretty good results with the six inch chunk of the uh, 61 ferrite now the original circuits of course had uh, tuned base and collector circuit we're using the crystal radio as our tuned collector circuit uh, that original circuit that we had, which was really separately biased stages, can be condensed into a little bit simpler circuit uh, by using a direct connection. Uh, so we uh, get rid of a few parts and uh, biasing up a direct connected uh, type uh, emitter follower is not that hard, even with three volts. All you need to do is make sure you have enough voltage for swings. So if you can bias the first stage for 2 volts, take away a 0.7 or 0.8, 1.2 volts on the output, that's plenty of uh, headroom and uh, you lose a few parts. And we are feeding, of course, our crystal sets, either uh, conventional or the uh, ferrite type uh, crystal set with the, uh, with the front end. And uh, pretty much, uh, voila, we have our, our circuit uh, with uh, our uh, emitter, uh, common emitter amplifier going into the emitter follower and uh, sending that straight into the crystal set. So that's all there is to it. Pretty straightforward project. Now if you need to cut the ferrite rod, God forbid, why would you ever want to cut a ferrite rod? Well, in this case I am cutting a 7.5 inch rod down to 6 inches for this video. Use a sharp hacksaw and as you can see I've wrapped the ferrite rod with some paper and I've got a little piece of cardboard under it to try to support it. We don't want to break the rod and then uh, score it uh, around the rod with the uh, with the hacksaw and then we'll be able to break the rod in a clean way so as not to uh, damage the rest of so it. So I've taken some uh, channel locks and put a little bit of tape around them and we now have our scored rod and we are going to break the rod cleanly against the table and here goes nothing guys. So I've got the got the pliers solidly on there and we're just going to give a little bit of a break. 
result is not too bad. A nice clean break. And we now have our 6 inch type 61 ferrite rod. Okay, we've got a variety of ferrite rods here. And uh, some of them are going to be uh, nickel zinc and some are manganese zinc. Um, also over here I've got some toroids that are uh, powdered iron. One way you can tell uh, if a core is powdered iron, which is the older technology, or some type of ferrite is, usually the powdered iron uh, cores are painted or protected in some other way. That's because the powdered iron material is very soft. Another way to check is to uh, hit it with a file. If it files very, very easily, it's probably powdered iron. But if it acts more like uh, glass, it's probably one of the more modern uh, manganese zinc or uh, nickel zinc uh, combinations. There are many, many different mixes. And I'm not going to cover all of that here, but uh, just keep in mind that uh, if you're buying a, a good quality rod that is uh, from a reputable house like uh, Fairwright or Amidon, um, don't expect that to operate the same way as something that you get from China, which is uh, manganese zinc. So this is manganese zinc, and this is uh, nickel. So um, we're going to try everything, though, and see how they perform in the TRF circuit. The other thing I'm showing here on the table is uh, some Kapton tape, which is some uh, high temperature plastic tape, and some ordinary thick duck tape. Um, the reason I'm showing that is uh, we need to protect the rods. They're very, very brittle, and if you drop them on the floor, you're going to end up with a, a broken uh, piece of hardware that uh, costs quite a bit of money. So. I like to wrap the rods. First thing I do is I wrap the rods and make sure that they're uh, somewhat protected by that layer. It's not really going to influence the Q of the coil in a way that's going to be important to this project, that's for sure. So another question, uh, can you glue pieces together to make the rod longer? And the answer is yes, um, as long as uh, the two pieces are in close proximity, the core will just be uh, continued and you can use super glue. Now the slightest uh, problem and the core and the uh, the rod will break of course. So again I stress the importance of using a support tape of some kind along the entire rod. Uh, once you wrap it with tape after the connection is made and set with the super glue um, you'll be able to use the rod. Also, uh, you need to support the rod in several places in a way that uh, you don't end up with a lever arm type problem or the rod will break. So, uh, with a small rod like a 6 or a, up to an 8 inch rod, you can usually get away with two support points. But longer than that, you need to think about supporting the rod in several places. So logically, there's no ferrite rod antenna that's going to replace a full-sized antenna out in the yard. But uh, we can start to get some performance if we start to increase the size of the rod. And uh, many times people ask, uh, can I glue sections on the rod? There's been a section glued on this rod with some, some of that super glue that has a little bit of uh, extra filler in it. And it, uh, uh, it's a good connection. Uh, electrically it's going to work just fine. But you will have to tape this over or that's going to be a, a typical break point in the ferrite. So you have to remember that uh, just because you glued it together that doesn't mean it isn't going to break neatly at that point. Really I'm starting to reach the limits of uh, capability with such a primitive building style without a ground plane. And uh, you can select a resistor where this thing will not feed back and want to oscillate or regenerate. but uh, if it were built properly on a circuit board or with a ground plane in ugly construction or with uh, a perforated board that's got a ground plane, I think you'd see that you'd get better performance and it would be a lot more stable. So I cheat a little bit and put a potentiometer in the emitter of the amplifier and I call it a regenerative pre-selector. So that's my way of saying uh, this thing's going to feed back, the rod's going to talk to the other coil on the crystal radio, there's not much I can do about that, 
All I can do is lower the gain and treat it like a regen. So let's go into a few of the windings that are used uh, on some of these ferrite rods. Of course, you've seen some of the tapped windings I've done. They seem to work very well for uh, matching into the transistors. And uh, laying the, uh, the secondary uh, off to the side seems to work fine. We see uh, double windings in the uh, low frequency and uh, high frequency uh, type of uh, tube anders. And we're seeing spaced uh, type uh, windings on these rods. There's basically four different types of windings. Uh, and I would consider the progressive universal to be a form of scramble winding. The universal winding is done on machines. And this is where you have all of the, uh, the right angles you're trying to produce uh, for the very high Q. Um, what I've found is, in general, um, you want the windings in the center, roughly at one-third the length of the rod for maximum pickup. I uh, haven't seen a lot of improvement in spacing the turns. Uh, you don't seem to get the, uh, the improvement you'd think you'd get. Um, the secondary uh, seems to work very, very well when it's right on top of the primary, as long as it's toward the cold end. And... Uh, you know, uh, if, for a direction finder, you want to keep balance. Uh, for low frequencies, uh, there's some pretty fancy winds out there. So this is uh, pretty well beyond the scope of this uh, of this presentation to get into the uh, the very complex winds that a machine can make. I would say this uh, progressive wind is something like a, uh, a universal wind that's. Uh, like tape that's been pushed out so it uh, has a funny shape you know when tape accidentally gets pushed out uh, but uh, is it something that you can do at home no so scramble winding is pretty much what we're stuck with at uh, these frequencies so you guys have all these nice fancy LCR meters uh, maybe some of you have got uh, network analyzers, or maybe some other type of uh, means of measuring inductance. Maybe you know how to use a grid dip meter or grid dip oscillator, and you can back out the inductance. But uh, when you have unknown ferrite rods, you really want to know if this is something you can use in your frequency range. So we're going to use the granddaddy of all uh, RX bridges, the Boonton 250A RX meter. This thing's been sitting here. I uh, let it warm up, uh, and we're going to use this to look at a few different rods to see if they're the kind of material we want to use for our uh, for our crystal set amplifier. So the principle of how the Booten RX uh, 250A works is different than most bridges. The test sample, let's say it's an inductor, a capacitor, or a resistor, is connected across corner C and D of the bridge. And its parallel components of resistance and reactance effectively change the values of C4 and R4 in the circuit. In order to restore a phase and amplitude balance, the variable bridge capacitor C4 must be decreased by an amount equal to the equivalent parallel capacitance of what you're testing. If the test sample is inductive, the capacitance of C4 is increased by an amount equal to the resonating capacitance of the parallel inductance. The parallel resistance of the test is shunted across to R4, reducing its value by a certain percentage, which changes the R4-C2 ratio and unbalances the bridge. To restore phase and amplitude balance, variable capacitor C2 is reduced in that value, reduced in value by the same percentage the R4 was reduced when shunted by the test resistance. The variable capacitor C2 can thus be calibrated directly in terms of the parallel resistance in ohms of the component being measured. Over the years, people have developed ways of uh, working with this instrument to measure antenna impedance, uh, to handle coax, uh, uh, Q of coils, uh, every, everything you can imagine. Uh, it's a very flexible instrument, but it does involve quite a bit of calculation unless you want to write some programs and uh, it has been superseded today by the modern uh, LCR and uh, network analyzer programs that we have so it is indeed an antique but it uh, was 
the way you did this work, probably from the uh, the 30s up through the uh, the late 60s. So first of all, we set the RX bridge frequency, and uh, we're going to be operating up to two megahertz. So I set it for two megs here on. Uh, on, on this range right here, which is the 2 to 4 megahertz range. Uh, we zero it out. We go to zero on the picofarad scale, and we go to infinity on the RP scale. Now we're going to use our fingers to unbalance the bridge. See, fingers. And then we basically are going to peak the, uh, the detector, so we get a good indication. Okay, that's good enough finger uh, calibration completed. Then we're going to attach the uh, the unknown uh, rod. I like to use like 25 turns on the rod so we can really see what the inductance is. Okay, I now have the, uh, the unknown rod with uh, 25 turns of wire. And uh, we know that this is an inductive component. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to um, start putting in some capacitance to try to resonate it. And we're looking at the, the meter as we do this, looking for a dip. Okay, we're balancing the bridge. Okay, that looks pretty good. Then we'll go over to the parallel capacitance, or parallel uh, resistance, to complete the null. Okay, I got my, I got my reading. Looks like we're reading 93.7, 93.7 negative reactants. Okay, let's try to calculate the inductance based on our measurement of 93.7 for CP. The formula is simply the parallel inductance equals 1 over 2 pi squared uh, Cp. 6.28 and we multiply that by our frequency times 2 exponent 6 equals, then we square it, squared times the capacitance, and remember we read that as 93.7, 93.7 exponent 12 change sign equals, and then we need to take the reciprocal, shift 1 over x, and we read 67.6 microhenries. That's got to be easier than an LCR meter. So now we slip in our unknown rod. Okay, here's an unknown rod. It looks shorter right off the bat. Let's see what we can do with the unknown rod. And as you can see, the, uh, the meter's gone unbalanced. So we have to figure out, ah, we don't have enough range to uh, measure this rod so it has less inductance than the other one. We know that right off the bat. So with this rod being smaller we're going to need more turns to get the same amount of inductance. So the instrument literally didn't have enough uh, capacitance to resonate the rod with 25 turns so we have to go to a higher frequency where the uh, the capacitance is, is more effective to get resonance. So I went up to 3.5 megahertz. So a lot of these rods start to fall away as you get above 1 or 2 megahertz, but 3.5 is not that much higher. And we'll interrogate the rod at this frequency. So let's see if we can get a null here. Okay, we're getting a null. There we go. Okay, between the, uh, the CP and the RP, we're getting a good null. And I am reading 34.9. So, I got a result of 59.3 microhenries. So, it's somewhat lower than the larger rod, as we would expect. 
So this is uh, comparing the uh, nickel zinc to the uh, nink, nickel, uh, or I'm sorry, the zinc manganese uh, rod. And uh, there's a size difference too, so there's some change, uh, some adjustments that we need to make. But uh, uh, this rod should be usable. We just have to put a few more turns on this to hit the broadcast band. So I'm not going to go too far with uh, measuring unknown rods, but uh, as long as you have a way of measuring inductance, and I think uh, that's easy enough to do. You can even do it with your grid dip oscillator if you're willing to back out the, the inductance value. Um, you will be able to estimate what the, uh, what the factor is, and uh, you'll be able to do some design work and get in the ballpark uh, for the inductance that you need for your either your crystal set or for uh, you know some type of amplifier system and uh, best not to be in the dark but uh, a lot of these unknown low-cost rods you definitely uh, want to check them out no reason to be frightened of the low-cost unknown rods we can measure them and uh, in many cases uh, determine if they're going to be useful for our projects and then buy a bunch of them. So using your kitchen table as the center of uh, DX and, uh, and reception excellence is a novel idea. Hopefully the uh, ferrite rod idea is something that you can use in your setup. Uh, I know that uh, not all of you can deploy uh, a 120 foot antenna or drive a 15 foot ground rod but maybe you can play with something like this. And uh, I hope this video has been uh, an enjoyable one for you to uh, get into winding with these ferrite rods.